Hello, everybody. Welcome to our second second meeting. Greetings, Jeremy. Why don't uh, Why don't you start us off? Yeah. Okay. Um, so I've taken, perhaps naively, I've taken on the challenge of uh, uh, looking at the cost of sleep uh, stability, um, and uh, that's led me. Uh, well, my understanding is that. Um, um, Matthew's intention was for that to be a more um, systems level analysis uh, of uh, the limits uh, on stability or understanding stability of the Costas loops um, rather than uh, uh, rather than performing simulation and doing it uh, empirically. Um, so to that end, uh, I've Matthew had already started preparing um, uh, the mathematics. Um, that the uh, that represent the uh, operation of the loop in the in the Z domain. I can I've posted the document uh, in Slack um, as it's as it's in its most recent form. Uh, so I don't know whether you guys can see that at the moment, but I could. What I could do is bring it up on my screen. Um, would that be helpful? Sure. Uh, so M Matthew had indicated that. Um, that a lot of this um, was basically taken from the uh, from the Gardner book. Um, so the first section you can ignore that pretty much because that's um, just a um, standard derivation of, of the loop for a typical uh, type two uh, second order transfer function. Uh, so loop loop transfer function, and there's its um, natural frequency and, and damping factor. And so I, I cribbed, I also added to that and cribbed some of the definitions of the of the various ranges um, uh, that are, are of interest. Um, so you can see those there. Um, uh, the story gets a bit trickier when we're talking about, so that's, that's for a continuous time um, analysis. Uh, so the story gets a bit trickier in the, in the discrete time uh, form. Um, so I was just wondering about some of these, um, some of these equations here that Matthew had uh, cribbed from the appendices of, of uh, Gardner. Um, I think I understand quite a lot of what's going on here. I don't really understand the the integrate and dump function. So this, um, uh, I, I guess it's something to do with um, saturation of the integrator. Is that correct, um, Matthew? Um, no. So the the integrate and dump in the Costa loop in in the one we're using basically uh, takes some number of samples and integrates those or accumulates those samples over a period. And then at the end of that period, it releases that accumulated value uh, to go down the chain and then it, and it restarts. So it, right. it's, it's uh, so that's what the function is. Okay, so it's not like, as in the continuous time case, it's not integration over all time. It's, it's a set number of samples, is that what you're saying? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, so when we look at these um, functions uh, that we've described here, this z to the power minus l, this is the. Yeah. Okay. So um, where in the code um, is the is the number of samples specified, and is it is it something that gets transferred over the uh, over the axi bus and read in initially because i know there are there are some places for the integral and the uh, proportional gains for the um for f of z which is the the loop transfer the loop transfer function and and i can see where those are directly in the they're, they're, i think they're word or yeah, words six and seven and eight of of the um, of what's getting what gets written into the register uh, map. 
Yeah, there, so there's the the L value isn't specifically specified. It has to be derived, but it's a it's basically the number of samples in the in the bit period uh, that we're integrating over or accumulating over. And so the it it depends on the if you will the sample to to bit period ratio. Um, so we know what the sample rate is, and we know what the the bit period is. Uh, so we just have to compute L from that. The sample period is a bit period, is, right? Um, yeah. Okay. Um, I'm not sure if I um, if I've fully understood there. Uh, yeah. Can um, you repeat that? Yeah. So basically, the the their bits are turned into into symbols uh in the modulator right so we take in a bit and we um are basically uh, making a we're multiplying that bit by half a coat or half a sinusoid so in so this it's a little weird but so half a sinusoid is the symbol period and the symbol period is twice the bit period and so the, the math is all neat and it works out. So we get a continuous phase transition when we're transitioning between bits. But in this case, um, we're looking at the bit period, which is the same as the bit rate and the modem. So right now in the simulations, we're running a bit rate of, of 56.2 uh, kilobits per second. And, um, and then the, the sample rate that we're using in the modem uh, just a second, I'll, let me pull up my simulation. Um, and so these numbers can change, right? Uh, the, oh, these are yeah. just the numbers we're using at the moment. So L will change based on different things. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, so the bit rate's 54.2 kilobits, and then the um, the sample rate is 61.44 megahertz. Um, right, okay, so, yeah, now I understand. And, and, and I did appreciate the fact that the, the those were these are values that can change in in the real implementation it's just that i wanted to get i in order to find some coefficients to start drawing things um like the root, root locus plot i have to start from some concrete value and so now i so this value of l is basically the ratio of these two two uh rates yeah exactly yeah yeah so it's about uh about 1100 in 33 samples per bit period. Okay, right. Now I understand. Okay, fine. And uh, the D that appears further on down here, um, uh, this appears in, oh, where does it appear now? In equation 10? Yeah, it starts to appear in equation 10 um and what i was thinking is that there's just some typo um for the 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 picture of the loop i've got here is is should the on the backward arm of the chain should that should that really be a d there and that's uh doing the conversion in reciprocal fashion yeah or, that, that's or, right it's so basically um we're just repeating samples in that in that in that uh block right so we're we're taking the the sample that came out of f of z and or the, the value and then we, we're just repeating it for that uh bit period so we're only updating effectively uh that value every every bit period as we get a new value from the uh right so this is this is repetitive interpolation basically right Right. So yeah. I, I think the the dash D was slightly different in that it's just um, it's not even a, a really a delay value. It's just a a, a repeated value, right? Um, I'd have to go back and look at the at the at the uh, chapter I was looking at to to recall what the D is. Yeah, it would be really useful. Yeah, it'd be really useful to get some some. Uh, I think I found where the. Uh, I get. I think it's chapter thirteen in the edition of the book that I've got. Um, uh, assuming, okay. Assuming what a, what we've got here. Oh, okay. So sorry. I will go back a step now. 
um, the loop filter. So this is intended to be a proportional, no, sorry, yes, yeah, proportional integral uh, style uh, loop filter. Is that correct? Right. Yeah, it's it's a PI PI loop or PI controller, right? So uh, yeah. it, we don't need the the D, but it, um, so yeah, it's the P and I. And P and I'm looking at this equation and uh, sorry, equation four here, and I intu intuition tells me K one is is the proportional element and K two is the integral element. Is that is that fair that, to say? I think that's right. Might, I might have to go look at that again, but I, I think that's correct. K, you say K one's proportional. I, I would say K one's proportional, yeah, because there's no um, because Z Z reciprocal over one minus Z reciprocal. That's that's the integrator, right? Right. Yeah. But what what's I mean the um, but you're not multiplying it by the the output of the filter, right? You're multiplying by the input, which um. So I wouldn't have thought the K2 would be there in the internal, in the inner value. But, uh, you know, th this is um, not my forte. <laughs> uh, no, okay. I, I'm so, good. so I'm I'm trying to map between what I can see, because I've, re I've read the VHDL, um, and my VHDL, I, I have done a little bit, some, a long time ago. Um, so I'm able to read it and, and roughly understand what's going on there. Um, and I can see that you've got, the things being brought in from the bus to initialize and computations being done on a uh, constants, um, uh, proportional constant and integral constant. So I'm trying to map those to, um, yeah, I'm trying to, I'm trying to map those to the, uh, to the mathematics that was presented in your, um, uh, nice write up. Right. So, uh, yeah, yeah, the D I think is, is, is L. I don't, I think, uh, <clears throat> D can be L. D can be first. L. Yeah. 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 And okay. then, um, um, and then, yeah, in the, in Gardner 13, a point seven equation is saying that the K one, uh, I'm not sure, but it is the, that, that matches the proportional plus integral loop filter. Um, yeah. So that that I don't know uh, if K one or K two is the let's see if it says. You get some if you multiply the thing out, you get you get K one, you get some product K one K two in the um, in the integrator. So there's there's not quite a one to one mapping here, but um, yeah, it's good enough for me to just sit here um, uh, just a little bit of confirmation that I'm going along the right track um it, it, yeah it certainly seems to me like you're you're going along the right track I, I don't see anything that's that i doesn't make sense to me in what you're doing it all looks pretty good okay um i, I was just looking again to see if i if it if they made it clear i'm sure it's here somewhere um the yeah. k1 k2 but that 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 is the right equation so um Yeah, the, the only reason it's, yeah. it becomes important is is further down where we get to. Um, so we get I, I get to this final expression of g of z, which I think is the is the open loop uh, function, and it's not made explicitly clear in the uh, in the document that, that you provided. Um, I, I presume I've worked on the basis that it. That it is so, so in order to get oh yeah okay so in order to get the the closed loop transfer function you actually get uh g of, g of z over one plus g of z and that's your h of z for the whole for the loop in, in its entirety um yeah can you make does that mean uh have we got agreement on that <laughs> yeah that sounds right to me yeah okay um, and we can see, but you see further down here, the open transfer function given by, we end up finding this. So this kappa is oh, that's right, from right. K, K of D and K1. And K, so yeah. KD, I think, is the gain of the um, DCO. 
Yeah, I think that's right. And so I, I think the K1 and K2 are like an amalgamation of the I, of I gain and P gain, but I don't think they're um, directly this, those. I think that they're a yeah. derivation of the I and Q, uh, of the I gain and P gain. Yeah, yeah. Okay, that's that sounds good to me because that's that's kind of where my thinking was going. Um, and and KD, uh, that's the gain of the numerical os uh, numerical oscillator. Or now, the is it, it's usually the detector gain. Is that is that is, not what is it that, is? Uh, um, I, I'm I'm barely keeping up, but like KD for these sorts of circuits is usually is usually the detector gain. That's what I kind of assumed it was when I saw the equation. Oh, this is the the phase frequency. Phase yeah, frequency. I, yeah. Let's see. Um... Sorry, I'm I'm scrolling up and down on my screen, and it's probably very annoying. Um, <laughs> <laughs> if, if shout out to anyone, if you want me to hover over a particular thing. I'm just I'm just uh, looking through Gardner to double check that. I think um, so. Phase detector and Gardner is KP. Ah, okay. Oh, sorry. Yes, it's right at the very top here. U U D is KP. Okay. Difference in difference in phase. Yes. Yeah, so that's equation one. Okay, so good. That's, okay, KP is that, and and so that's just just to confuse matters. That's not K proportional. Nothing to do with the loop filter. Right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good. That that's um, yeah. The output. I've even written it there. The output of the phase detector with the coefficient KP. Yeah. Okay. I believe, judging from where it's coming from. Uh. Oh, okay. Output of the numerical control oscillator. We don't have a gain for the NCO, and that would match. Uh, so that means unity, but it's um, in units. Uh, does it have units? It's it's, 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 a, it's it, Gardner describes it as pseudo units. Um, yeah, it's yeah. it's in the text, but it, it's. I think effectively unitless, but it, there's uh, some pseudo units associated with uh, with the detector gain. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry, with the NCO gain. Um, yeah, because yeah. it's 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 essentially phase uh, reciprocal phase. Uh, yeah, input input some number per phase um, per rate yeah. of change of phase. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, Okay, let's assume we've got um, L and D. L, L and D are equal, and we'll assume this is the open loop transfer function, and we know all these capitals and these KDs, K1s, and, and all the rest of it. Um, L being particularly large, I mean, uh, so what I think I what I think the aim of the game is is to is to substitute inverse. Is to turn it into a polynomial, which is uh, in, in terms of reciprocal z, in order just to solve it, and then back that out once once we've got to the um, uh, once we've multiplied it out into a, a rational fraction. So, because I'm error prone, I've got a computer to do this, and I, I've uh, that's what I was looking for the um, MATLAB license for, and that's not, that's just a side story at the moment now because I've managed to do it in Python. Um, so I, I've used the symbolic math library in Python to uh, take the take the function here and turn it into some nicer polynomial. And I've, I've um, that's very prettified, cool. Prettified the output to yeah so. Uh, it was it was surprisingly easy to do that actually, but of course I've, what I've done is treated k kappa kappa one kappa two l and d as symbols um, in in terms of the expansion because um, we don't know what those are. Well, we now know what they might be, um, and 
I think I have to look at some of the source code to do that. So I, I need to find uh, where in the well, test source code uh, that you're writing these uh, values in for the proportional and integral part of the loop. Yeah. Table. So they're, they're uh, basically, um, I, I just picked values till I got it to work in simulation. So that, that's yeah, why I, this this approach, this this analysis is useful in that, that you know rather than just picking numbers that work um is you know pick numbers that that work more optimally right um yeah and and so i don't know what those are so like i said i, I just kept te uh testing until i i got it and right now for example i'm just using um, um the p gain is 16 and the i gain is 20. And can you just tell me the where? No, can uh, you just put, point me in the direction of where that appears? And uh, so I presume this is what you guys refer to as the firmware that uh, passes these yeah. along to, to a FIFO uh, to the bus to set the registers right. in, in the FPGA. Yeah. So where, where does that live? So there's a LPF config one. LPF config yeah. one. And and I, I gave you the wrong number. I think it's fifty, and and that's shifted up into the, so the upper sixteen bits have the p gain, if I remember right, and the lower sixteen bits have the i gain, and um, and that is register. Um. 2C. 2C. Yeah. In the current design, uh, it's 2C. Just, so, just, just for my benefit, um, can, can you tell me roughly where I need to look in the source code uh, for the, oh. not, not in the... Um, uh, well, I mean, the so you're looking for HDL. the... Okay. Yeah, so just, in the, in just, the, so, just so I can trace it through from, from end to end. Sure. Uh, I, basically, there's a... Um, let me, I'm pulling it up. So there's a file in the source code now. You, you need to look in the um, R, dev RDL branch. Dev RDL branch. Oh, okay, so this is the, the, the new style of doing things. So I'm, yeah. I, I'm kind of uh, peripherally follow, following the discussion along in, in Slack, but I'm not totally up to speed with what's going on. So dev yeah. RDL branch, yeah. Yeah. And so there's a file in there called MSK top CSR, and that's a wrapper file for, for the AXI interface and the, and the registers. Ah. And so, so, but in, in here, there's the signal assignments um, that from the registers coming out, coming out of the register block, right. To, to the top level. Um, and so there's a LPF uh, I gain and LPF P gain. Uh, that are signals that, that are coming out of this that come from the registers. And and where in the firmware uh, do these get uh, passed along? So they're, they're register writes uh, in the firmware. So right now, for instance, uh, we have I we have a um, a build working on Pluto, and when we configure that build, we just it's we uh, are writing those registers with the values that I was using yep. in simulation. Um, and, yep, and so, so I'm, just, I'm just, I'm just interested in what, where in the sort, where in the source code, I need to look for the name of the file or something like that, just so, so that I can eyeball it. Sure. So the, if you look in the um, sim folder, there's a yep. file. Um, oh, I've, I've, MSK. I've seen, yeah, I've, I've seen the stuff in the. In, in the so, HDL. Yeah, so um, in I'm, the MSK test.py file, so it's a Python file. Um, and so this is what I'm using to simulate. So these in that file are all the register writes that um, uh, okay. are being used to simulate. And then yeah, in, a, yeah, yeah, yeah. In, in the scripts folder, there's a Pluto MSK PRBS.sh file. And that's, that's the file that 
I'm using currently to configure um, the FPGA. So it's the same register rights, basically. It's the ah, um, okay. So they, they both, I mean, I, all these values I took from the simulation. Yep. Thank you very much. No, that's, that's exactly what I wanted. Yeah. Yeah. And, it, and I know I didn't need it, but it was um, it, just to satisfy my own curiosity and, and oh, sure. join up, join, join up some of the dots in the, in, that are left over. Okay. Um, now, assuming that the um, symbolic manipulation worked. Um, so if, if you, cared to read that function that is identical to what we've got written there in the document. Um, we out pops this nice polynomial, rational polynomial. Um, of course, yeah, there's some common factors, of course, that need to be taken out there. But you see, these D plus Ls and Ds x to the power d x to the power d plus l these are very high order so finding the roots of this thing that i think there there are many 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 roots to this yeah. um, i think <laughs> i i think this is i don't know what's going to happen if i try and plot a uh, root locus of this and whether or not this is the right approach um because I think that, that what's going to come out of drawing a root locus diagram is something is something bizarre and a little bit crazy. And it may turn out that using one of these stability tests is doesn't make sense. So that's why I'm kind of interested in whether you guys yep. think I've made the right approach here, or is it expected that because it's a discrete discrete time uh, PLL that uh, the analysis is going to be hard and not really um, something that gets done often. Well, I mean, initially, you know, there's the, it, from a digital implementation point of view, D and L, uh, you know, they, they don't necessarily have to be small. The main impact of them being large is that the accumulators have to be large so that you don't right. overflow your accumulators. But, mm -hmm. you know, so this is something I hadn't really considered in terms of, uh, you know, so my thinking is we didn't need a decimator. We didn't need to reduce that that ratio because we can just put big accumulators in. But on the other hand, you know, maybe the, you know, it makes sense to keep the loop stable, uh, you know, to to decimate so that we have a, a smaller um, number of samples that we're accumulating. And yeah, okay. that yeah, so that makes L, you know, we can that would bring L down to some, uh, you know, we can make that a more reasonable number. Um, it okay, may so be, think... maybe, you know, after we uh, it's a reasonable number, you know, we can scale it and, and leave the I don't know if we could leave the uh higher sample the higher sample rate and just ex kind of derive you know stable values from from this from the from a lower sample rate. Okay, so I, it's a, it's a bit of investigation that needs to be done. So uh, yeah, I'll see what happens when when I plug the numbers in and um, right. But I mean, it, it might be useful if if that blows up, you know, to use use a smaller, you know, L, you know, probably in the fifty to one hundred range. Yeah. Okay. To There's, yeah, it's all good information for me. It just said in context is um, is um, is very useful for me. Um, okay, uh, so I think um, I think that's it. Enough information for me to keep going. Um, and uh, just another so changing. Changing topic slightly, so I think that that's as far as I've got um, with doing this. And and if I can come up with the coefficients, um, then I should be able to draw the root locus for these things and uh, run some stability tests and see what numbers come out there. It might be nonsense, it might make sense, um, but I can do that. So just changing tack a little bit now, though, um, and I'll stop sharing that.
if I can. Stop sharing. There we go. Um, so just, just on the topic of um, having uh, Git submodules uh, for all of these components, um, it's not really relevant, I guess, at the moment because the, the intention is to, to do the do a theoretical analysis of, of the thing. Um, but uh, now that the now that the components of, of the Pluto and MSK have been split out into um, uh, submodules, uh, it now means that one can't uh, write individual uh, test benches, or one can't easily write individual test benches for things like the Costas loop, because of course the Costas loop lives in a submodule with the MS MSK demodulator, and now all of the framework around generating the pseudo random bits and and modulating and um, having an available input signal to do your testing means that individual test benches so like more like unit testing rather than integration testing the whole beast from end to end, to end that now becomes a little bit difficult because we, we would have to introduce dependencies from uh, sub modules to other sub modules and perhaps even the top level, and that breaks the kind of uh, encapsulation, so that... if, you, if you like. Um, so yeah, I, no... I... go ahead. Um, so I the the numerical oscillator was one good candidate because that, that seemed fairly easy to drive, and you'd already written a small test in there, um, and I've expanded on that test and calculated out. Uh, phase numbers that should be expected after a run of so many uh, hundred microseconds or whatever it was. And so um, I've committed those changes to my personal fork of um, the code and I've created a pull request. Um, the, it's, it's fairly trivial stuff. It's just a stopping and starting and testing the enable disable functionality of the, uh, of uh, of the NCO because it, so it's it's trivial stuff but it's uh, but I have written it um, and so that was one area in which I could quite easily add test add Coco TB tests to um, uh, but yeah in order to test the the cost of loop you uh, I think it's it's a, all paths are leading to this idea that I have to generate generate MSK modulated signals. Um, and there's no problem with that necessarily. And um, uh, Michelle has alluded to the fact that there is this a Simulink model of uh, the generation of the test. Now I found um, a GNU radio companion flow graph um, that, that did perform the function of the modulation um, and demodulation, the whole stream is there. So Michelle, was that um, a slip of the tongue that it was a simulate model or uh, or uh, in addition, is there the GNU radio companion flow graph? There is a simulate model and to on, and I know I've, I've been owing you this uh, for now two weeks. Uh, so apologies for the delay on that. Um, but uh, yeah, there's works. a simulate model, but also GNU Radio is a powerful tool for things like this. So it, I, a both and will work. Um, but so today I'm going to, uh, actually I was looking for screenshots of the Simulink um, model to, to show you what it can give you. Uh, at the very least, it can can create for you some values of the of the signal, uh, time domain yep. signal, you know, and, and that so that you can use that Python or or as a GNU radio input file. So yeah. today is the day that it will happen. Oh no, no worries about it at all. I, I I'm just I'm merely yeah. being a curious <laughs> explorer. At the Yay! Moment. <laughs> no, I totally understand. That's that's yeah. the, one of the one of the greatest values of of things like this is being able to to do the sort of work we get to do it. Um, but yeah, the, the way it's set up. And I'll walk you through this and show it 
either uh, as a set of screenshots with some text or and or like a, a video. But what it is is a MATLAB uh, script. Um, and the, the script sets up all the variables, sets up the workspace, and then calls up a Simulink flowchart or flow diagram, and then constructs uh, the MSK signal. And then is used in uh, the attempt at the time was to do modulator, demodulator, and then use HDL coder to convert that uh, Simulink model into HDL code, which worked, but was um, not, it, it worked and it's human readable and that's all all well and good, uh, but not, would not fit on the Pluto. So um, no uh, efficiencies, okay. just kind of doing its own thing with, so the, the code for uh, human code still wins uh, the day. Uh, yeah. And so the, the, and the modulator and demodulator work for, is in Simulink and it, it does work. And it's remarkable to see it implements a very similar um, system from one of the papers that that uh, Matthew found. So it uses Massey Hodgart, and I think the the current code slightly different, but but same ballpark. Um, so just as a learning tool and as a, having a model, it, it very very useful. But the real useful part for you is probably the creation of the MSK signal itself, and. That was also like, wow, when you see it and you see how it's how it's made, it's really quite remarkable. There's nothing quite like minimum shift keying. It's uh, Matthew also found a great paper that, that so these are, there's five different ways to to look at MSK and explain it to yourself. <laughs> uh, and all, yeah. all of them are valuable ways to look at it. So it's uh, it's good stuff. So, yeah, today is the day. Uh, uh, fortunately, uh, back from from a. a multiple day adventure this past week. So I had very limited time, but I'll make it clear how to use the the script. You just, you run this live script, then you have a, so you have a workspace, uh, that workspace is saved and then brought back up. That'll save you about 15 minutes of time because it grinds through all sorts of different things. Um, and then it will call up a, uh, a Simulink uh, diagram. And then from there, it's a question of saving out to, to a file in MATLAB that's, uh, about as easy as any other language. So, well, I've, I... I've picked... sorry, go on. Oh no, I had nothing important. Um, yeah, so I've 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 built the the GNU Radio uh, flow graph um, and done similar things with that, and and it's got nice time domain output and frequency domain output. Um, so I have seen. So I'm I'm guessing that it, it's going to look. It's a fairly similar process 